Hello, good evening. Welcome to Upfront. Now, on 31st December 2019, the very incident that happened in 1981, that is the removal of the Lehman administration because of that coup d'etat, was commemorated on its 38th anniversary. You've heard from the former president, Jerry John Rawlings, and the many things he said about history, about what ought to be done going forward, and what he considers to be distortions in that particular history. Now, today, there's been a statement from a man who was very active in those days and has been part of this. And I'm talking about Sergeant Daniel Aloga Akatapari. He's my guest from his London base, and he'll be joining us via Scalp on this particular conversation. The conversation is supposed to, among other things, enlighten people about what really happened on 31st December in 1981. And beyond that, have the conversation on what he's asking the President of the Republic of Ghana to do, i.e. to set aside this day as a day to commemorate and also to institutionalize the memory of the President of the Third Republic of Ghana, Dr. Hilaliman. And Sergeant Aloga Katapareta joins us via Skype now. You welcome, sir, to Afront. If you can hear me, say you're welcome to our front. Now, I'll proceed by first and foremost asking you, and I've seen the statement that you released today on the commemoration of the 31st December 1981 coup d'etat, which many have said that you played an active role. Now, take us back to that time. Can you just enlighten us on what were the factors that led to the removal of the Liman administration and how and what really happened on that day? Okay. <laughs> I, I first met Ron, let, I, I want to go back to June uh, 4 a little bit just to explain the background. Okay. In August 1979, I was arrested by the AFRC on an alleged plot to overthrow that regime. I was with two colleagues, but uh, they exonerated them, and therefore I was uh, the main person. Uh, what happened was I had written a document which I had uh, circulated requesting the AFRC to implement certain policies before handing over to remove the need for such an uprising again. One of the key things that I said in that document was that ordinary soldiers, particularly those that you call GD, general duties, most of them were illiterates or uh, middle school leavers who joined the army. And upon retirement, they went into drunkenness, poverty, and then they died young. And I was one of the GD uh, people. So I could see clearly that there was something uh, that needed to be done. So I said six months prior to retirement, the soldiers should be given uh, some trainings in civilian uh, skills so that when they retire, they will not end in uh, abject poverty into destitution. So this uh, you know, became very popular among the soldiers. And some of them actually uh, started asking their commanders uh, about the need to do something about that. So I got arrested and uh, uh, basically uh, was uh, <laughs> Uh, taken before the whole AFRC, there were 15 of them, plus their advisors. Uh, if I remember well, I think Kojochi Kata may also have been there. The, it was, the room was packed. And then uh, they asked me, and I told them exactly what I've just narrated, together with some other uh, 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 issues. Then, when I had finished narrating my, uh, my uh, defense, uh, and I, I, one thing I said was that, look, you are asking us to tell you exactly how we feel. So how can you be uh, uh, arresting me if I've done exactly that? So when I finished, they started arguing among themselves, forgetting that I was still uh, standing in front of them. Uh, I remember Bwati Jan uh, uh, Rollins pointing fingers at uh, each other. You know, so when they re then realized that I was there, they took me, uh, they marched me out, red light marched me out, and then... Uh, when I was brought back in, 
Jerry uh, told me that uh, it was my final warning and that the next time I'll not be so lucky. And, you know, uh, I left and when I got out, there were a lot of uh, soldiers, uh, you know, who had come to watch the, uh, the, the, the trial. So that's how I met uh, Rollins. So after the handover, I went to Cape Coast to study and forgot, I wasn't, I, to be honest with you, I was no more interested in the army. I wanted out because my mates that had left in uh, secondary school form one and came, to, I went to boys company. They were now entering the university. So I wanted to, you know, uh, go back and join them. So I did my uh, O-levels and my A-levels privately at St. Aquana Secondary School. And I got admission at Cape Coast. And I was going there. I went there, actually. And I, I forgot all about the army. That was it for me. And any time I came back to visit uh, the barracks, my family was still there. My wife would tell me that uh, someone had come to look for me. Then on an, uh, one occasion, she told me that she asked the person why he was looking for me. And the person, after hesitation, said, uh, Rollins was looking for me. And this happened on an, a, a number of uh, uh, times. And, but uh, I think the Easter holidays of, uh, uh, we're talking of 79 now, you know, still 79. Hello? I can hear you, sir. Yeah, okay. So we're talking of something now, when all uh, uh, Rollins uh, was looking for me. Then uh, uh, around uh, March, the Easter holidays of uh, uh, the, the, the first year, 1980, the, uh, the Easter holidays, when I came back, I went to the BAM library to do something, and I bumped into uh, Zaya Yebo. So Zaya Yebo told me that one Chris was looking for me. So he arranged, I've forgotten how long, but it took some time before I met Chris again. I met uh, Chris for the first time. I didn't know him. So he introduced himself. He was a bit apprehensive. And, and, and uh, we spoke. And for, he forgive me. Uh, was, uh, uh, if I could interrupt that briefly. By Chris, you mean Mr. Chris Atim? Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm very sorry. Uh, Chris uh, Atim. Mm -hmm. So uh, he told me that, uh, you know, uh, Jerry wanted to speak to me about some issues. But he was a bit apprehensive. You know, because there was a history be between Jerry and I. So, uh, but I told him that I didn't have a problem meeting uh, uh, Jerry. So, uh, we, we met. I think the first meeting we, we met at the beach where you've got this uh, beautiful hotel in La, uh, La Labadi. Labadi. Labadi Beach Hotel. Uh, Labadi, yeah. So, we met at the beach uh, in the night, maybe nine o'clock or so. And Jerry was apologetic. So apologetic for what uh, I had gone through. He told me that he was the one who saved me, but most of the AFRC uh, 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 members wanted to, to, to execute me. And it's the same thing Bhatija also told me, <laughs> and some of my mates. You know, so that is what happened. And, uh, uh, you know, what he told me, uh, you know, I liked it because he was going, we we're going to have a, a fair and just society. And uh, for me, I, I just, you know, get. Uh, there's some, uh, I just, when I hear the name of Kwame Nkrumah, it just, uh, you know, uh, it, it, some, <laughs> I'm just so much in love with the man. So for him to have uh, come to the same conclusions, you know, I was so pleased uh, with him. And uh, uh, I agreed that, yeah, we'll, we'll do the project. You see, so that's how uh, it started. And uh, I read uh, books on how to make a coup d'etat and so on. And I brought the knowledge to bear uh, in the whole planning process. No, so let me be clear in my mind. This conversation you had with the former President Rawlings, it was after he had handed over in 79, after the election that brought in the Liman administration, or it was prior mm -hmm. to that time? Yeah, we are talking of uh, around uh, maybe April. Maybe April uh, 1980. Okay. Is, now, this is one of the reasons why I'm saying that we have to apologize. You see, <laughs> because look, uh, if Jerry had been looking for me in 1979, it, three months after the handing over, come on. And when I met Jerry, he told me that, oh, uh, he remembered uh, what happened and he wanted me to be on board. Yeah, so, uh, uh, and he, he even gave me uh, uh, some roles. Uh, uh, the role that I played after the handover was the very role that he told me that day. You know, that I'll be in charge of the armed forces uh, defense committees and 
and all those things, you see. So, you, you know, it means that by 1979, by the end of 1979, the coup was in place. Because when he met me, he said it was imminent. You see, mm. and you, you don't plan a coup uh, like uh, you, are, you are going shopping. You, you, no. it's, it takes time to, to put things together. I, I get your point. My only clarification I'm seeking from you is that the former president Rawlings yesterday stated categorically that the conditions in the country demanded that the Liman administration and its members who had forgotten about what it took for them to come back to come into power and for the third republic to be put in place and that the military people were actually they attested a lot of freedom a lot of the power and they were not willing to be suppressed or going through any of such processes and that they were not impressed with the where the state was being run under Liman. Was it the same reason he gave you for the removal of that government? Oh, uh, for me, we spoke about, it was about politics. It was about uh, incremism, socialism, uh, social justice, and, uh, you know, these things that he's saying, it doesn't make uh, uh, sense to me uh, at all, because how do you assess uh, all these things within three months? It's not uh, possible. And the coup was made and reasons were being looked for, basically. That's the way I see it. So Jerry was held bent on returning to power, full stop. If he did not get people like me and my colleagues to plan this thing properly, he would have ended up doing another uh, 15th May. Mm. Now, I want to understand that part too. You said that your own was purely on political and maybe ideological reasons. But the Liman administration had been seen to have CPP links and that they were supposed to be continuing the legacy of the former president, Osage Fu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Yes. You see, uh, that is a very good point. And that is why I am uh, very sorry for participating in this thing. Because, look, uh, the PNP was the... Uh, if you like, uh, uh, the, 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 the new CPP, if you, if you like. And look, after, the hand, uh, after uh, 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 President Lima had been arrested and he was at Peduasi, I went to see him on about four occasions. And he told me that he was more in Krumais than us. You see, and if you don't mind me saying this on, uh, uh, on your program, he told me clearly that this was not about socialism, but it was about... Uh, the Chikata family wanting to uh, this, uh, 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 capture power after having tried for several years and failed. And on, on, my, uh, on one occasion, he told me that I should take care of Jerry. Uh, I went there with uh, uh, Awa, my very good uh, friend, Sergeant Awa. He told us that, look, we should look after ourselves and we should look after uh, uh, Jerry and we shouldn't trust these Chikatas. That's what he told me. So for me, I'm saying that if Jerry had, for example, after the handover, worked with the uh, PNP administration, and like I've said in my document, if he had worked with them in a capacity like a uh, June 4 legacy minister or something of the sort, then all the grievances that had been raised uh, in June 4 could have been handled by the Liman administration. But Jerry didn't want that. He wanted power. By all means, he wanted that seat because he had tested it and he just wanted to get back there. And yet you are also convinced that that was the best way to go after knowing fully well that um, the reasons you say were not because that administration was corrupt, was not because the military had actually lost faith in that administration, and it was not because there's a lot of problems that were still not being fixed. You believe that it was ideological. That, that's why I'm failing to reconcile yeah, your personally, point. Personally, I went with Jerry and Chris at team because they sold an ideological... Uh, it was so seductive. Yeah, it was just so seductive. The, uh, I was so convinced just to have uh, uh, the, 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 the fact that you are getting back whatever Kwame Nkrumah was doing, you are going to continue from that point. I wouldn't have gone to school without Kwame Nkrumah. The free education system... My father would not have been, without the free education, my father would not have been able to pay my school fees. I went to uh, secondary school. I was given school uniform. I was fed. I was given a bed. I had free homework. 
it, you know, you, you, and it gave me opportunities to excel in school. So for me, Kwame Nkrumah is, if you like, uh, the, the best African ever. Yes. Okay. It's now, true that if, if we had left Liman there, mm -hmm. Liman may have, you know, pursued Nkrumah's goals. And that's why I'm saying that, with hindsight, this was an error on my part, particular part to have believed that Jerry was a better option of implementing Nkrumahism rather than the Liman administration. Now, let me get this part clarified. The former President Rawlings yesterday says many have forgotten the circumstances that gave birth to June 4th and 31st December 1981 and have deliberately spent huge resources sponsoring a distortion of history based on outright lies, half-truths, and the rendition by cowards who run away during those heady days. Now, first and foremost, could this your reasoning for being asked to be on board part of the distortion of history and also forgetting about what the real issues were? Uh, you see, on 31st uh, December, I mean, uh, uh, on the 1st of uh, January, look, the coup was not popular. I'm, I'm telling you that people did not just run to the streets like June 4th. June 4th was different. On 31st, people, there was no spontaneous uh, you know, uh, uh, rallying and things like that. It was people like uh, Kwesiedu, Zaya Yebo, uh, and the student leaders who worked with Amate Kwe and, and organized the TUC to do some, I think, on the 2nd or 3rd of January. You understand? So it's not like uh, 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 people were yearning and crying for the overthrow of Liman. For goodness sake, look, we are talking of 27 months in power. Jerry had 20 years, and he still wanted Justice Annam to take over for a few months, and then he will come back, like a, a Putin, <laughs> you, you know? And these are his own words. I'm not the one saying it. These are Jerry's own words, that he wanted to uh, hand over for a period and then come back. So if 20 years was not enough, how can you overthrow somebody uh, after 27 months? And not 27 months. Okay. I would say three months. Because from 1980, the coup could have taken place any time. Now, let me get this part. You're not one of those who run away and are not telling your stories, right? <laughs> well, uh, I, I went into exile. I went into exile for a very long uh, period, if that's what uh, uh, he means. Yes, I, I crossed the border. But look, it took some bravery because, you know, I was the one whose government got people into exile, and I had to go and join them. I see. I was nearly beaten up by Joe, Joe DeGraff, John the vice president. And it's a funny story. One day I'll tell you. Okay. And uh, it was J.H. Mensah, he's as small as me, <laughs> who, who intervened to, uh, uh, to save him. J.H. Mensah was my very good friend. We did a lot of uh, projects uh, 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 together. It's a shame I couldn't come to Ghana to uh, uh, join him. Again, for political uh, reasons, I, did, I didn't uh, come. I was invited to, to, to come over, and I didn't. You know, all for ideological uh, uh, reasons. So that is uh, something that is very important uh, uh, to me. That's why it is such a shame that Jerry had to choose uh, the wrong company. You know, well, I have been told I shouldn't say the wrong company, because if he didn't want that company, nobody forced it on him. So there you go. Now, let me get this part also clarified. I need you to explain to us what really happened on the 31st of December, 1981, and how was this school successful? <laughs> okay, I've told you uh, previously that there are certain things I don't want to talk about until I have personally met four people four individuals and apologize to them directly. I look them in the eye and say sorry to them before I'm able to uh, tell you how uh, the whole coup was planned from the time that he met me. And I read my book and I decided on how we we're going to execute it. I will not be able to go into certain things, but I'll say this to you. On 31st January, there was no fighting. 
the whole fight December. Thirty first. Uh, I'm talking of uh, the whole coup to, to, uh, for the coup to succeed. Okay. L well, the only fighting that took place was on the first of January mm -hmm. at thirty seven, but that was accidental. Colonel Ofosafia, who was in a uh, uh, two BN, and to be honest with you, I was surprised that uh, uh, he, he could come all the way from that place because it wasn't part of the counter plan. Yeah, because I knew about the counter plans and everything. Okay, and it wasn't uh, Ofosa Pierre coming wasn't part of the counter plan. So I was very surprised that something like that uh, could happen. So it meant that there were some things that I didn't know. But it turned out that uh, Colonel Ofosa Pierre did this on his own. Yeah, so it was uh, he, uh, he decided to counter on his own. It wasn't part of uh, a counter plan by the military intelligence or the security services. This was his own uh, way of contributing to uh, keeping the Third uh, Republic uh, uh, intact. So when they, they got to 37, there was an accident with another car. So they had to disembark too early, you see. And that is what saved the, uh, the revolution, maybe, you know. And then uh, there was a uh, firefight, some firefight, and a lot of it was uh, not directed fire. But some people uh, died there. We lost uh, soldiers on both sides uh, on that particular day. Now, if I can just uh, say something about this particular issue. Mm -hmm. You see, Jerry uh, often says that he was put under pressure by the likes of uh, young soldiers and uh, student leaders and so on to execute uh, you know, uh, people, you see, this can be true because uh, one of the soldiers who came with the two BN uh, uh, troops, he was a second lieutenant. He was arrested and brought to Gonda Barracks the following day. Jerry was not in at that time. I was uh, in Gonda Barracks. And the soldiers basically wanted to lynch him, to lynch that soldier. They wanted, you know, because they were angry. You see, so... I was trying to address the situation when Jerry arrived from town. When he got uh, 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 down, the way Jerry spoke to the soldiers, the way he, he was so brave to face the soldiers and tell them that that was not going to happen. This soldier was uh, 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 doing his job. And, you know, it was just so impressive. So Jerry is not somebody that someone can put pressure on him to kill somebody. Because that was uh, one clear example where, for example, he could have sacrificed that soldier in order to please the soldiers, but he didn't. Okay. You see, so it's not true that uh, uh, Jerry, he yielded to pressure from anybody. You see, I just want him to own up, to say, look, that was the, the, the situation. It's a revolution, and I did it. I'm sorry. End of story. You've got the indemnity uh, uh, clauses there to protect you. So I, I don't understand him. You see, I don't understand him. I'm not saying that he, he should uh, uh, say I'm guilty, take me to court. No. But the decent thing is for him to say, I'm sorry. I was responsible. I was in charge. Things went wrong. We couldn't achieve our aims. You are not God. You can't achieve everything. Were you saying that the quest to bring about a revolution of a sort, which was the crux behind the 31st December coup d'etat, that particular quest was well-intentioned? Yes. Uh, listen, there is nothing better to ha than to have a, a just society. Mm. A society in which, if you are born into the country, you have the same chances as any other person, no matter the background of your, your parents. When you have that situation, you release the talent of everybody, and not only the, uh, the people who are well-to-do. Okay. You see, today in Ghana, mm -hmm. today in Ghana, it is about who knows you. If uh, 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 your parents are poor, you are likely, no matter how hard you work, to grow up poor and die poor. If your parents are well to do, no matter how lazy you are, they will fix you. You see it around. Look, uh, they, 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 they send their children to school abroad and they get the best degrees. They come back and they are the CEOs. Mm -hmm. It's a dynasty of the elite. That's not fair. You see, you can only get it in a 
uh, if you like, a laissez-faire type environment, a capitalist uh, environment. But if you have a fair and just society, a socialist uh, state, you don't get that. You see, you look, look at Gorbachev and others. You may condemn the Soviet Union and so on. Gorbachev did not make money as a head of uh, uh, the president. Castro did not. But look at our leaders. Look, look, you, you look. But let me be clear. You are a member of the PNDC. Did the yes. PNDC at least try to do something like that, to correct society, to put in the various elements that will ensure a just society? To be honest with you, you see, a coup is a funny uh, uh, project. It's a dangerous and funny uh, uh, project. You know, you are plotting a coup, and you see, when you ask me who are the people who uh, uh, plotted and planned the coup, what do I tell you? I say it's Chris Atim and Rollins, and they brought me in, and I did a job. That's what I tell you. But the point is that after the coup, then you get some characters coming in. Because by the nature of a, a coup, it's a conspiracy. Okay. You see, so uh, you are, it, it is difficult for you to sit at long meetings mm -hmm. to discuss uh, a policy. So uh, 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 people are told different stories. People are, are given different reasons for uh, what is to happen and the agenda. But as far as I'm concerned, per my discussion with Chris and with Rollins, it was going to be an incrementalized revival. That was it. But after the coup, so many other characters came in. And uh, one of the uh, problems that you face in any uh, system is uh, uh, financing, the trade relationships, and so on. Okay. So uh, Chris Atim was sent to the East European uh, uh, countries to try and organize a barter system because we're facing a uh, petroleum crisis and the shortage of uh, various uh, materials, such as hospital uh, materials and so on, medicines and so on. Chris came back empty-handed. And you could see that Jerry immediately got so discouraged. You see, it, it's not a... Go, look, ruling a country is a serious business. You can't have it easy. You, you can't just have a, 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 the, the, the power without the responsibility. You have to work silly hours. If you are not prepared to do that, then you have no business being in government. So rather than him, you know, uh, uh, seeking the mobilization route, look, we're able to mobilize the students to do a lot of things for free. Okay. If we had continued setting an example, we would have been able to organize the workers to achieve a lot. But Jerry had an alternative being offered by his friends, uh, you know, who encouraged him. To go down the IMF uh, route, you had Chachu Chikata, you had Kojo Chikata, you had uh, uh, Kosiboche, you had, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mensa Bedema, and uh, some bank, uh, uh, World Bank uh, uh, officials. And they will go into huddled meetings, and basically, by April, the PNDC, as far as I was concerned, was over. As in April 1982. Two, yes. In terms of the philosophy, look, Jerry told me on several occasions that, look, Alaga, the Americans say that if you stop telling, saying that they are the, uh, imperialism is our problem, yeah, they will turn Ghana into the South Korea of Ghana. Of Africa. So, uh, 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 the South uh, uh, Korea of Africa. You know, so I just uh, uh, laughed at him because, look, the Americans are in Liberia. They established Liberia. And look at Liberia. You know, so I, I just didn't, I couldn't understand it. And he told me this more than four times. So, and he was, to be clear. I'm getting angry mm -hmm. that I was uh, basically saying that our problems was that of colonialism and neocolonialism. You now, see? Now, let me, let me get this clear. It was this ideological departure from what was promised to you before you joined this quest to change the state through the coup d'etat that became the source of the problem for the PNDC, you believe? It's still, it's still uh, aching me, you know, because I gave up a lot at a personal level. I don't, I don't know whether you know my, uh, my background. I, maybe uh, it's unnecessary to go into, uh, uh, into that. But the thing, it still aches me that I had worked so hard 
and then had to give up everything. My, my brother died in exile. My sister uh, vanished uh, on the day that uh, I was arrested. And I've never seen her again. So at a personal level, there are just so many things that are, uh, uh, are lost. You know, those days there were no mo mo mobile phones. That's Some true. soldiers I hear they were led by uh, one uh, Captain Partington, I don't know. They went there and then, uh, you know, basically they ransacked my And my sister uh, vanished and we never saw her again. My brother refused to uh, uh, come back to Ghana because he said he was a Democrat and we had overthrown the uh, uh, a democratic uh, regime. He only returned when my father died. And that was the time he came to visit me in prison. And we went to the north together to go and perform my dad's uh, uh, funeral. Then I have lost my friends, my comrades, Kwama Jima. You, you know, these were uh, people who were sacrificing. They sacrificed everything. You know, they, they, they never slept. They were walking miles, you know, and putting up posters and so on to support Jerry during the time that uh, the, the MIs were uh, uh, chasing him. Gave him all that support. And then you execute them without ceremony and put them into mass graves. And then yesterday, you say you are holding a minute of silence. For who? Which of them? If you are prepared to hold a minute of silence for those that have died, does that include the people that you executed? It doesn't make sense. I need to take a break. After the break, I'll come back to you. After the break, too, we'll be joined by the PNDC's former youth and uh, sports secretary, Zaebo, still on the conversation about 38 years after the removal of the Liman administration. Was there a just cause? Have we attained? What we sought to do with the coup then. You welcome back. This is Affront. My name is Raymond Darko, and our conversation today is about what happened yesterday. Yesterday, the 38th anniversary of the removal of Liman's administration was actually commemorated. And the former president Rollins had lots to say about what's happening in the country and more importantly, what he considers to be distortion of history by people predominantly who left the kitchen when it was too hot now the first of this conversation has been predominated by a member of the pndc at the time let's not forget when lima was removed the provisional national defense council was installed and the provisional national defense council was in charge of the state for almost nine years within that particular period and that council had its member Sergeant Daniel Aloga Katapori, who is the person who joins us from his landing base on Skype as we speak now. You're welcome back, sir. Very much. And here in studio is an, a, a secretary for youth and sports. Yes. And <clears throat> um, Mr. Zai Yebo was the first person to be appointed secretary for youth and sports of the PNDC. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Now, because I've been speaking to you, if you give me a second, I'll come in studio and briefly um, get some views from Mr. Zayabo on this matter. First, you also left the kitchen when it was too hot. The former president really doesn't think your account of what happened is one that reflects the facts on the ground. Actually, there's a lot of ignorance about that. I did not simply leave the kitchen when it was hot. Mm. I left Accra and went back to Borga to my previous job. Twice in Borga, I continued to work with some members with the People's Defense and Workers' Committees in the Upper East region for okay. some time. So I did not just leave. I left at the end of 1983. Okay. So I was around. Now, when I was in exile, I became a, a correspondent on Ghana mm -hmm. for most international and local magazines and newspapers dealing with Ghana. I wrote extensively on the, on, the internet, on the structural adjustment program. I wrote extensively about human rights abuses, and I wrote extensively about the direction which the regime had taken. At that time, nobody actually accused me of not knowing what was going on in Ghana because I knew more about what was going on in Ghana then. There were lots of Ghanaians in exile mm -hmm. from previous politicians, from the PND, uh, from the Liman era to the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council era. Okay. So there was, it was an opportunity to catch up and to exchange notes. And no one could accuse us of being ignorant. We were in touch with Ghana on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, th th that point, I, I, I'm actually seeking to explore further, because the, the, this is a former president who believes that 
the accounts by people like you, yeah. your narrations have nothing to do with the actual truth. Yeah, I mean, what is the truth? What is the truth? Basically, since May 15th, when Rollins try, tried his abortive coup, mm -hmm. he, has tried to, he has tried to create the impression that what he says is the truth. What he says cannot be the truth. One man cannot be the repository of truth in a nation's history. What he narrates is what he knows. Okay. What I narrate is what I know. I wrote a book about it in 1992. Mm -hmm. If what I wrote in 1992 was false, he could have counted it. He could have challenged it. He didn't challenge it then. So in effect, you're not just coming up in the year 2019 no. to come and say that this is what happened. I have never stopped talking since I left Ghana in 1983. And anyone who knows me knows that I have never. Mentioned any international magazine, journal, newspaper that deals with Ghana. And my articles are lots. Why do you think he will say so? You see, when we left, basically, the scene was clear for him to distort Ghanaian history, especially the 1982 so? period. In that time, Alaga was not around to state what he's saying now. Mm -hmm. I was not around to say anything. Chris Atin didn't say much either. The only people, his, his AFRC colleagues, okay. particularly Major Bwachijan, mm -hmm. did a lot. He also wrote a lot about these things. But in the absence of that, he continued to, to give his own narrative of what has been going on in Ghana. And he continues to do it. And most of his narratives are completely false. To be fair, he was chairman of the PNDC. Yes. He also was in charge of the FRC at a point in time. Yeah, through so, that time, yes. I sat in the cabinet secretary, uh, the cabinet mm -hmm. meetings. So I know what went on. I know some of the oil deals that were being discussed. I know what really went, and most of the cabinet members at the time were, were, were basically bureaucrats, they knew, I mean technocrats, they knew okay. what they were doing, so I'm not accusing them of anything. Mm -hmm. So and I, I was an insider. So you cannot deny, in fact, even after I left, like I said, I continued to pursue this, I continued to investigate, to research. I had a mm -hmm. lot of time on my hands. I did a lot of research on the structural adjustment program, and I wrote okay. a lot. And that's why I was able to write a book. Mm -hmm. If you read all African magazines within that period, you will not fail to see my articles. And at that time, not a single person from the PNDC or from the Royal side challenged any of my articles. Even they rejoined that to say, you were wrong. So why they're sitting there, I could be wrong. Now that I'm sitting here and I've seen what is going on, no. He is wrong. Because he wants Ghanaians to believe his version of events. We have our version, he has his version. So let us both pursue our, our versions of Ghanaian history. And let's see who, 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 whom the people will believe. He says he will set the record straight soon. Well, he's been saying that since, uh, since 2015. What, prevented, what has prevented him from setting the record? After all, he's the one with lots of honorary or doctorate degrees. So nothing prevents him from setting the records. He should set the records because we are here to answer. What I'm trying to say is this. Because we were not here, him and his colleagues could distort Ghanaian history or t at least distort our role in it. In fact, they went to the extent of trying to remove all the articles I have written from major libraries in, in London. Really? Yes. I wrote a book called Butchers of Jack Rope. They took it. So if I was lying, all that they had to do was write rejoinders. They have PhDs in their midst. They have people with doctorate degrees, people who have been to the US and have been to London and have been to all the universities let them write their own version. At least the only PNDC member so far who has written a version, which I do not challenge, because I haven't read the whole book, is, uh, what's his name? <laughs> what's his name again? The former Attorney General. And later, yeah. Emmanuel Hansen. No, no, no. Oh, Hansen also wrote a lot. Yes. No, um, oh, what's his name? My, my brain is, uh, when I George remember. Ekins. No, 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 no. He was the okay. foreign minister. He was the foreign minister. He was the foreign minister. Oh, Later no, on, he Obed became foreign minister. Obed Asamoah. Obed Yes, okay, that's part is of it. Is he also thing. saying that Obed Asamoah's version of events is wrong? He could say that. Because apart from Obed Asamoah, we were both in cabinets. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And I bet you that some of the events that are narrated about what is going on in government will not be counted by some of those who were there. And I could tell you some of them. But they have kept quiet because they have their own version of events. Obed Asamoah has also written, I have written, now, whom is he saying is, is lying about events in this country? I have no reason to lie. He is the one who wants to create a narrative where he is the only hero, 
In fact, he's been a hero since he says since since May 15, mm -hmm. a hero on June 4th, a hero of December 31st. We are not running a, a Rambo type society where one person can defeat a whole Ghanaian army. That's what he wants to say. What it, I'm saying is that it wasn't possible. It was, how could it be possible for one person alone to stay June 4? In fact, on the day on June 4 itself, we were in Legon. He was not there. He himself was in hiding. His friends came to Legon to beg us to go and demonstrate on the streets of Accra. Some went. I didn't go, but some went. Now, so how, uh, what did he know was going on if he himself was in hiding for at least a couple of hours? Right? December 31st, too, the same thing. According to some of his own colleagues, he disappeared at some point, only to reappear. So, you see, everybody has their own version. But you supported December 31st. Oh, yeah, 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 wholeheartedly. What was your basis for supporting December 31st? What had Liman done wrong? It is not so much as to what Liman had done wrong, but what he did not do. Like, you see, some of us felt, and the lie that was sold to us then was that, look, AFRC was a very short period, so they could not transform Ghana. Okay. All that we wanted was the complete transformation of Ghana into a society where at least there will not be so much poverty and want. Air Force was it. three months yes. from June to September. Yes. Yeah. Now he says, at least that's the, 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 the narration he sold to us when we were in Legon was, look, only three months, this I could not do anything. This is who specifically? Rollins. That's, okay. the, that's what he sold to us in okay. the June 4 movement. Mm -hmm. Some did not buy it. Most of the, actually, most of the members of the June 4 movement did not buy it. But that was the, the narration. And some of us bought it. That was a short period. It was a short period. So what he now needed was a longer period to execute the revolution, to do A, B, C, D. Was not, it was not because the nation had been virtually downgraded to the point that there was no way it could continue. It was not because corruption was at this apogee. It was not because the system had collapsed almost under the man. Yes, yeah, it's, it's as if you plan a coup first. Mm -hmm. And then you look for the justification. That's what happened. Yes. The justification was plenty. Yes, there was calabule, there was corruption, the economy wasn't working very well. But then three months of a regime of a government like Le Mans, they couldn't have expected the economy to pick up, even our own PNDC. The economy did not pick up for a very long time. And any time you ask about it, it was as if it didn't matter. So what I'm saying is yes, some of us believed in the justification for the coup. Now, th those justifications would, would, have been, would have been okay if, after the coup, we were able to implement even some of them. But after the coup, everything was put aside. And Rollins and his, his friends were doing what they wanted. Kalabule was returning. For the first six months of the coup, corruption was nil in this country. And we'll tell you, because none of us, neither myself, nor Akataporo, nor Krisa team, nor the People's and Workers' Defense Committee leaders took any money from the state. Okay. His friends were. A lot of the mess in the sports council, for instance, were due to his friends who thought they could just walk in or send a letter to some fictitious letter to say, I'm going to Poland to play, uh, what do you call it, tennis. Give me money. And I oh, said, no, I see. You can't do that. That was happening. Yes. And that was still in 82. You can't do that. So the corruption has started seeping in. And you ask yourself, why? So if we remove Liman because of corruption or Kalabule, what are we doing? We're basically returning to the same thing. And then the economy. One of the things we agreed, at least, or we thought we had agreed, was that Ghana would not go back to the IMF without us trying our own homegrown solutions. So when then Rollins and Boche decided to go to the IMF, it was a, it was a shock. And that was when everything basically fell apart. Because we would not understand what was going on. But that means you poor ideologues. You're not willing to con uh, uh, accept the fact that the reality was that you needed the help of the IMF. No, maybe we were naive <laughs> at some point. Okay. <laughs> naive, yes. yes. But we're not simply <laughs> ideologues. We had, we had an alternative plan. There are many countries in, the, in Africa which have not gone to the IMF and they haven't collapsed. Ghana, we but they had have gone to the level that we had in this country. Don't oh, forget, yes. we had some serious commodity crisis. We also had some serious issues even to do with um, farming, to the point that uh, there was virtually scarcity of food. That was not something you could get the IMF to address. Mm -hmm. IMF solutions, are, 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 we all know what they are. They tell you the same thing. And they've been telling Ghana the same thing since 1966. And that was our argument. Our argument was, look, since 1966, 
almost every year you go to the IMF and the World Bank, they tell you the same thing. Remove subsidies on, on food, yes. on, on fertilizer, remove this, remove that, uh, close down some educational institutions, increase school fees, and so on and so forth. And we are saying, look, the state of, the, of Ghana then was saying that we could try our own. A champion tried it and it worked. So why don't we go back there and try it? Operation Feed Yourself, Operation Feed Your Industries, and similar strategies worked and that jump on. I'll come back to you for a second because I'm willing to know at what point did it occur to you that the idea for which you had joined the PNDC was never going to happen. I will come back to you on that. But I, I, I saw you had a very <laughs> brief um, response to this comment I made about you basically felt bringing in the IMF was a wrong decision, but really, we have seen how the IMF has played roles in this state on 16 different occasions, the last one just being the year 2015. Uh, well, remember J.H. Mensah, finance minister, under the Buzia regime, there's nobody, there's no government that we've had in Ghana that you can say was a, a more of a darling of the IMF more than the Buzia administration. Mm -hmm. J.H. Mensah refused the IMF. And he had an argument with uh, 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 Dr. Buzia. So the IMF doesn't always have uh, the solution. They've got one uh, particular solution, and that solution, you must fit yourself into it, regardless of the domestic uh, uh, circumstances. So okay. if you rely on them, you, you are... Basically, you become a, a, how do I put it, uh, you have to, you see the currency, uh, the, the way mm -hmm. the currency has slided, it means that you don't put in controls, you don't plan. You see, it's a laissez-faire uh, uh, agenda. You see, the poorer you are, the greater the need for you to plan. I, I, look, when I was, uh, uh, well, now I'm a bit better uh, uh, res uh, resource-wise than uh, it was when I first came to this country. We used to go to the supermarket with a calculator. And you, you had to write your list. Then after a while, we relax it a bit. You see, so a country too is the same thing. The poorer you are, you have to plan. The IMF does not want you to sit down and plan. They want you to uh, allow your currency to fluctuate, and then people will be able to use it to buy dog chains, to, to, to sell, to order uh, 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 grapes, when we don't have medicines. So the chancellor goes to, uh, sorry, the finance minister goes to raise money and then brings these uh, uh, dollars into the country. And then people, you know, just uh, because they've got CDs, they take these dollars and then they, they order, uh, you know, handkerchiefs, toothpicks, and so on in the name of the IMF program. How can this be good for a country like Ghana? <laughs> we, are poor, we should look after our, our money properly. But... You, you can't do that under the IMF program. So I've just given you an example why it doesn't make sense to always go for the IMF program. And now, look, when I had uh, uh, the, 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 I think it wasn't the current government or the previous one. The previous that said, one. Uh, they were going to terminate the IMF uh, uh, program. I was uh, uh, pleased. The government and I hope, uh, currently they look did. domestically to solve the problems instead of always relying on the IMF. Okay, now let me make this point clear. Um, you have said in your statement you issued that I am employing President Anna Akufado to consider instituting a day of remembrance for the Third Republic on the 31st of December each year. The President should reflect on the fact that the Third Republic was hardly three months old when a plot to overthrow it was hatched. The Liman administration spent most of its time and resources on security, partly because of its unlucky draw of being the first government after the 4th June 1979 but mainly because Rollins was hell-bent on getting back into power. Anybody with a smaller sense of justice and conscience must feel frustrated for the Lehman administration. Hence my call for the Third Republic Day in honor of President Lehman. This was your demand. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, uh, I'm eat, eating a humble pie. Yeah? And saying, look, uh, it didn't uh, work out and it was wrong to start plotting to overthrow somebody, uh, you know, uh, if you like, just two, three months after uh, 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 inauguration. It's not fair. There's nobody who can uh, solve uh, Ghana's problems within that uh, 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 period. He wasn't given a fair, a fair chance. And you see, it is not just Lima, but the third 
uh, republic itself. And that's why I'm uh, uh, pleading with uh, uh, President Kufu to consider. Yeah, President Kufu, do I get you? Yes, if you can hear me, President Kufu, do yes. Okay, well, I should be able to get back to him, but let me pass, let me get your comments on this one. Do you think it's a good idea? Mindful of what has happened over the period, his, his thinking is that it's tough, it's tough. In any form of commemoration at all, should be in honor of the Liman administration because it was unjustly removed from on hindsight and from what we know so far. Um, a remembrance day on that day will be fair. Well, it's, it's yeah, it, it is a possibility. Mm -hmm. But it's the kind of thing that I think the, the, the CPP or the, the Liman government, though the remnants of the Liman government, should have considered long ago. To okay. say, look, we're not given a fair chance, and we think that it is important that we commemorate it. Because what is the point of commemorating June 4th and mm -hmm. December 31st? And leaving out um, the period within his, which the PNP government tried okay. to stabilize the country. Now, my final question to you is that the former president Ronald says, I'll tell my own story because of the current distortions that's happening in the space. Is it welcome news to you? It's welcome news. I've always said from day one, let him write his version. You see, I've written my version. Let him write his version. Let us write, others write their versions of the story. Mm -hmm. But I bet you it is something he cannot do because there are very serious questions that Rollins has to answer in trying to write a book like that. He has to answer those questions. Specific one will be what? The matter of the judges, that is something that will remain on Ghana's conscience until it is solved. And so as somebody who writes, I know that you cannot write it because unless you are prepared to be honest, you are prepared to be bluntly honest and to say, yes, I made these mistakes and I'm prepared to correct them. You cannot hide behind calling people cowards and saying all kinds of things. That is, calling somebody a coward is not a historical fact. Why? People can decide to be heroic today and cowardly tomorrow. So let him write. I think I'll, I'll welcome a book from Rollins himself. I'm not asking for his surrogates to write for him. He himself must write it in his own words. Let me thank you so much. And I'm sure this conversation <laughs> sure will continue. And I would, forgive me, but I need to go. Uh, many thanks to you, Sergeant Daniel Aloga Katapari, um, who was a member of the PNDC at some point in time. And the very first. PNDC Secretary for Youth and Sports, Mr. Zaire Boto. Thank you so much for joining us on this day's edition of Upfront. Folks, that's where we end the day.